Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Moon. The Garage Gym Athlete Podcast is a result of my desire to build better humans, unequivocal coaches, and autonomous athletes. I've spent the last several years obsessing over program design, nutrition, and every other way you can optimize human performance. This podcast distills the latest scientific research with what I've learned and blends it with the not-so-scientific field of mental toughness. We are here to build you into a dangerously effective athlete. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find out more about our training at garagegymathlete.com. And if you want to pursue more into the field of coaching and programming, head to endof3fitness.com. Thanks for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jared Moon here with Ashley Hicks and Joe Courtney. What's up? Good morning, Tog. Yeah, we'll get right into it. <laughs> um, so today, uh, what we have planned for everyone, we'll be going over a study, uh, and the study is on periodization. Uh, pretty cool study. You know, we'll get into it. It's a systematic review and meta-analysis, which is great. We've been doing more of those recently. Uh, because the findings are just a little bit more uh, concrete. So we'll be going over that. Uh, our topic for today, it's heating up in most parts of the world. Uh, specifically in Texas, next week, we have our first triple digit on the forecasted at least. So 100, 101 oh, man. in Texas next week. So we'll see. In May. Yeah. Woo! Yeah, it's going to be that cold out brutal. of here. So we're not talking about Texas heat. We're actually talking about hydration and electrolytes and things that you should be thinking about for performance and staying hydrated and, uh, you know, keeping your electrolytes up while you sweat a lot more in the summer months. And then we'll be going over a meet yourself Saturday at the end. Uh, and Joe will be briefing that. So let's get into the study, uh, or no updates. Let's, we haven't done that in a while. Let's get some updates going on. How's everybody doing? How's daily over decades challenge going for everybody and life in general? Ashley, how about you go first? Daily over decades is great. I'm in the nineties, 90 days. So almost halfway because you know, hundred would be halfway for me. Um, so I don't think I'll quite get the 300, but it's okay. I'm just going to keep going obviously after the 200 is hit. Um, but no, it's going well. Strength track is going well. Um, adding some zone two stuff in. And then Saturdays have been my Murph play around days, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I've been just kind of messing around with uh, different zones other than zone two and three. I've kind of been tapping into zone four for that. Um, this Saturday, I'm going to do a half Murph. And my neighbor is actually, um, she really wanted to do Murph. So she's been training with her brother who does like CrossFit stuff. And I was like, why don't you just come work out with me? it's going to be a lot better. And so <laughs> I'm like, girl, watch out for all that high intensity. <laughs> like, I feel like anyone who goes down that route, I'm like, no, no, I know what that leads to come here. I'll help you. Like so playing with a loaded gun. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Um, so her and I are going to do some fun Saturday stuff leading up to it. And then, um, no, life is good. We have movers scheduled. So June 29th, all of our stuff will be put on a truck. And we will be, you know, following them, following them there, hopefully. Um, if not, we'll make it a little bit longer of a cross-country road trip. Not cross-country, but, you know, mid-country mid road trip. <laughs> Border to Texas, it's like midline, yeah. It's cross-country, yeah, it's far enough. Um, but it's only 11 hours from here, so it's not terrible. You just take I-10 and go west and you just, boom, you hit it. So it'll be an easy drive. Um, no, but we're just kind of wrapping things up here and, um, it's kind of bittersweet, but you know, Scott's been super busy with work. It's like, they know they've got like six weeks of active duty time in him left. And they're like, here, <laughs> do all the things. <laughs> and so he's, uh, he's been busy, poor thing. And he's slightly salty because I feel like he's got senioritis, but it's like even worse than that because <laughs> he knows what the light at the end of the tunnel is going to be. So it's been, uh, it's been funny to, to listen to him talk and stuff. I'm like, oh man. You should just tell them that he's busy. He's like, I'm busy. <laughs> just put in a bunch of inputs. Sorry I feel guys. Like <laughs> people getting out of the military, just say they're out processing like four All months, medical appointments, like four months <clears throat> before they like even get out. Like, Hey, where's such and such or in there? Like, 
oh, out processing. And we're just supposed to be like, yeah, okay. Yeah. He's out processing. Um, yeah. I ran into that crap all the time though. as a supervisor it pissed me off so much because they, <laughs> they'd have so much time left and like, we need them to do a job and be like, Hey, where's this person? They're like, Oh, out processing. And I'm just supposed to like shut my mouth and be like, Oh yeah, yeah. They're out processing. Cool. Like call them up, get them back. They have work to do. Uh, yeah. I think it's different though. Joe's laughing. Cause he's like, definitely was that guy. That's it. That's it. <laughs> I think if he could, he would though, for being an instructor pilot, like unfortunately that's not the case like they need him and he right. needs to fly but you also know my husband I mean the dude had like started out processing like six months ago so I'm pretty sure like he's like pretty much taking care of all the things slowly but surely because Scott is like okay I got a to-do list I'm gonna get this done early and that's just how I roll so that's kind of you know I guess he he made himself available so poor thing he's suffering poor but anyways all right Joe what are your updates? Things going good. <clears throat> uh, ever since the baby came, I think I've only missed two days. So I missed the day after. And then That's impressive. once the following week, because it was a low sleep week. And then I haven't missed a day <laughs> since I'm on like 30 some days straight. So I've, I mean, I had to make up if you remember, I had like in January, I was like 12 days in the hole for the goal. Mm. And I had to make up time and I've started to make up time. I don't know where exactly I'm at yet i don't know if i've hit 100 yet i'm like right on the edge but um pretty close to that uh yeah so and then like i shared with you guys yesterday i i, I thought i was gonna miss my first day yesterday in a while because i had to fly down to la pick up our car drive from la to monterey it's a full day of driving but i got back earlier than expected and still got my training in and it was just like a who am i situation because i would so usually after like noon if i haven't trained i'm just like I'm good. I don't, I don't train in the afternoon and I hadn't trained that late in the day in like three plus afternoon. years. <laughs> yeah. I just, after, after, so after, you know, if I hit, if I have like a full meal and it's like in the afternoon, I'm just like, no, nah, it's just not happening today. It's, it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> so, uh, that's yeah, just you how go my on body a walk, right? You could just, that's not a workout though. Whoa. I mean, whoa. I can walk. Here we go. <laughs> not for me. Like that's not a training session. <laughs> Well, going walks everyone's supposed to deem their own personal definition right. of a training session. And apparently for you, if it's after 12 o'clock and you have eaten food, a training session may only be a walk. You know what I mean? Because apparently a real training session can't happen. So that might be your exactly. secondary training session if those two other prerequisites are met. Correct. So walking can be a <laughs> training so. session. Uh... <laughs> I'm helping you game daily over decades. <laughs> yeah see now see you, you go you come up with this stuff and there's other times where i say i do something and you're just like eh, no you're just like i call bs well i would always push someone to do something over not do it 100 yeah and so if it's like all i can do today is a walk like i think i have counted one walk for my daily over decades as my training session that day um and it was when i was like just kind of sick i was like like I was like, my body was like fighting a sickness, like a, like yeah. a cold type sick. And I could have probably trained, but I also think that I would have made me sick, like much worse. And so I went on a very long walk. Um, I think I ended up going on for like, like an hour and a half. And I still didn't feel good after that. I was like, I don't know if that may have been too long, but yeah. see, I'll, I'll, I make those kind of like modifications based off of how I feel. And that's the only time I've been like, okay, walk counts as my training session today. Cause yeah. You know, that was 90 freaking minutes and I feel like crap. And I mean, you're pushing a stroller with Landon and he's going to sleep, right? So, I mean, just go until you hit 300 calories. Uh, no, we don't have a stroller. Do you have a jogging stroller? A minute. No, no uh, we, it's in Texas, so we don't have, we just haven't gotten it yet, but he's not big enough to be in a stroller anyway. Well, I would just wear him if adapter. I really wanted to. I used to jog yeah, with Connor just... when he was young and put him in the little car seat and just adapter and yeah, but go. That would, that would require buying something new and I just don't feel like it. <laughs> Okay. We only have the world. We're only, we're only I'm trying have to help you kid. out here. I'm like, you can do a zone two run with your kid, and I also don't easy. need to because Liz is here. Like, why would I? Why would I, I punish oh, myself with true. a stroller? <laughs> that's true. I don't, I don't know. All right, those days will come. You good? Otherwise, any more updates? No, I think that's that's, that's <laughs> about training. Training. I mean, I, I, it really it's just talking about Groundhog's Day, just with the kid. And then training and then work and then it's just we just there's not really anything we can do all the all the grandparent visits have already come and gone which is nice because it's like hey it's cool they're here but it's like see ya yeah. <laughs> bye <laughs>
guess it's me then. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. After Eleanor was born, that was I did. She was born during like a like a fit week, and so like I and I tested that fit week, and then we did a twelve week cycle, and I didn't miss a day. Wow. In those twelve weeks, and I PR'd almost every thing from the previous fit week baseline, um, and so you you gain experience through children. She was my third. Um, you're just talking about like step one is consistency with the first kid. It's like, you mastered that. And I feel like that's probably what I did. It was just like, I just need to get a workout in. I don't care what it is. Uh, Graham, I don't even really remember what was happening. Um, but then Eleanor, I was like, it's, it's all the things like, I'm not going to miss a day and I'm going to increase my performance over these next 12 weeks. Um, and it's hard to do but it's awesome that you're doing it. It's awesome that you you're getting in like seven days every single week with a newborn. I didn't, I didn't know how that was going to go for you. So <laughs> I didn't either. Great work. I mean, especially with 12 days in the hole in January, I think we are all yeah. like, well, he's done. Like, <laughs> yeah. If I missed another week, it was just like, well, I'm done from 300. Goodbye. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's you're in quite a spot. Um, I'm good on 300. I've, I've hit it every day. I don't know how many total training sessions. I'm like the only person not tracking total training sessions. I think everyone else knows how many <clears> they've done. Um, I just how look at my, when you get I just look at my averages. Like that's how oh. I, that's how I look at these challenges. Like as long as I get six days per week and I get my 300 minutes, that's, I'm going to have 300 training sessions at the end of the year. So I never, I'm never looking at how many I did in a month, um, or, or anything or how many total I've completed. Uh, I just get real like tunnel focused, but maybe I should pull that stuff, but it's going pretty well. Um, I haven't had any issues, just a funny story about the daily over decade. So if you're not familiar with the challenge, you can go to daily over .com and you can kind of read what we're talking about. If you're a new listener, or if you're just wondering what the, the rules are, uh, but I'm doing 300 level three, which means I have 300 training sessions in a year, 300 minutes per week of training minimum, and also uh, 300 calories per training session for it to count. Uh, so that's what I've been doing. And last week, I think it was last week. I did a workout on Saturday um, and I just, I, I wasn't really paying attention. I was like, it was my, my sixth training session, I believe. And I was just like, okay, whatever, get it done. But I guess all my oh, other training I sessions had this. been shorter <laughs> in duration. And so I finished and I looked and I had 12 seconds left before I would click over to 300 minutes for the week. And I literally could have just sat down in like recovery in zone mm -hmm. two for 12 mm -hmm. extra seconds and gotten that had I just looked at how much, how much time I needed beforehand or walked for two minutes after the workout for a cool down and still counted it. But no, I had already ended it. And, uh, I was like, I have 12 seconds left. And so I had to train on Sunday and make it seven days that week. And with the 300.3, you have to do 300 calories. Mm -hmm. So I had like a 35 minute training session on Sunday that I just really didn't need because I was 12 seconds short from the previous day. Uh, so it's funny what these challenges can, can do to you. Um, and otherwise I would have never done that. I'd been like, I'm not training Sunday. I'm good. That's six days this week. Like we're good. So moral of the story is just look, plan it yeah. out a little better, Jared Moon. <laughs> yeah. Just, just take a look at it. Um, and then life wise, I cleaned my garage. I'm really happy about that. And by clean, I mean, got rid of all sorts of crap that, um, we we've had started slowly piling up like my old desk went in there. Uh, Emily is doing like a remodel on a house and like some of that, like trim and like vanities started like making their way into the garage. And like, I was like, this is getting a, a bit ridiculous. It got to the point where my brother and I were like, finding like these weird, like that's your space over there. And um, this is my little space that I carved out for me. I couldn't take it anymore. So I spent like eight hours on a Sunday cleaning my garage out and making it perfect. And it's, uh, it's in good shape. Now I got rid of everything, like everything. It was a workout on top of the workout. Yeah. I got 20,000 steps that day. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. So that's like, with just just the life plus like i think that was the day i had to do that 35 minute training session or whatever so yeah good stuff but clean garage is everything if if it's a gym as well so mm -hmm. takeaway for the listeners 
But we can get into the study. The, this one was done in 2022. Effects of periodization in strength and muscle hypertrophy in volume equated resistance training programs, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, so I don't know how much we need to dive into the study specifically. We will, we'll kind of go into some of the takeaways and anything that uh, the two of you found interesting from the study, of course. But I think this is a better opportunity to talk about uh, periodization, non-periodization, within periodization, talking about linear periodization and undulating periodization, uh, maybe more for an educational primer for anybody listening. Uh, and we can also kind of translate that to how we do it at Garage Gym Athlete. That's how I thought today would be a best use of everyone's time because um, finding a study that says periodized, periodized strength training is good is like, almost a no brainer. Like if there's a strength program in existence, it is periodized training. And so like, you don't like, I don't, we, I don't need a study to tell me that they're effective. Uh, but it's cool that the, that this, uh, backs it up and we can kind of pull out some of the smaller things as well. Um, so what did you two think of this study overall? So just to run through it real quick, I liked that the for periodization versus non-periodization the volume was equated to make sure that they are lifting the same so that you know that you can't say oh well periodization is better because over time they're going to lift more but if the volume is equal during during the entire what the entire time uh, takes that out of it so point for periodization um the strength versus hypertrophy when it comes to periodization that one also makes sense that it favors strength because for hypertrophy I don't think weight or load or volume even matters. It's more about just the stimulus and the, 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 what you're doing to your muscles, breaking them down. So that pretty much makes sense too. Right. Well, so let's jump to that takeaway. Cause you kind of just so the listeners know major takeaway periodized strength training increases your strength gains. Not so much. It's not that it doesn't, it just not as good. Uh, yeah. Non-periodized, non-periodized is not as good as periodized in terms of strength gains. When it comes to hypertrophy, it's kind of null. Like you can gain strength or hypertrophy, which is muscle growth in either one. Um, and then linear, uh, I don't know if I need to get into linear and undulating yet. Um, see if you guys have anything to say about it. But overall, periodized and non-periodized, that was a takeaway. It's better for strength to be periodized. Yeah. So the, actually, what, uh, I was going to get into undulating because that was one of the more interesting parts of it for, to, to me. And so undulating versus linear periodization, that is, um, I, and I actually look, had to look it up. I know we've, we've kind of done it a little bit here and there, but not that much in training. Um, and undulating is you're varying sets, reps, loads on an either daily or weekly basis. So you're not following a consistent line. You're jumping up and down. Um, and I, I, even with load equated there, undulating was close to what linear was but undulating worked best with trained athletes. And that was interesting to see because, and I guess it, you know, logically it could make sense because if you're changing loads and how you're lifting and um, the different ways you're executing your strength, trained athletes are going to know better how to execute that versus untrained are going to just go up and be like, okay, I guess this is just what I have to lift today. Um, So I think undulating is, and we'll, we'll uh, um, actually I'll just end there and see what else you guys have to have on undulating. So undulating, you're right. Um, so I, I program undulating periodization all the time on hard to kill. Like that's, mm-hmm. I, uh, we did, we definitely do linear as well, but we jump back and forth. But if you're looking for more undulating, uh, you'll probably find it a lot more on the hard to kill track than you would any of the other tracks. But also this is where accusations from athletes come and I'm not going to say like in any sort of overwhelming capacity, but if anyone ever has any feedback about hard to kill, uh, strength programming being random, that happens to be a cycle that I did undulating programming. They do not understand what undulating is. And so right. it's their lack of knowledge that makes them think that this is random programming when really it's a, a more proven model. Once you get outside of the honeymoon phase of strength training. Um, so undulating is, is very powerful and used mostly on the strength track. Uh, yeah. And it works best with, with trained individuals. Yeah. So I like the undulating and I, I, but I mostly, you know, since I program strength track, I mostly do linear. Um, I've thrown in some here and there undulating, but I think I will, I'm going to look into doing some more on it because I think also the mental fatigue of it, especially if, if you're, uh, you know, showing that it it's good for experienced lifters, but also mentally thinking of like the varying what you're doing week to week, day to day, um, could be better than just, Oh, I guess today I'm just doing 
two two reps less and a little bit heavier cool like and to a certain point strength can get, be simple and oftentimes boring and like formulaic which um i personally don't mind but i know some people might prefer a little bit of that variety and showing that undulating is still just as good at, uh, with a uh, linear um, periodization uh, even especially in trained athletes then um that just makes it even more of a, a attractive option ashley yeah so i mean you um you hit the nail on the head on you know the takeaway that they that they were um trying to find with all the the different studies but um for me i had to look up a lot of the stuff uh the hypertrophy the hypertrophy stuff was interesting to me because it was only a 1% difference, I believe. And so they felt like it was, you know, obviously not significant enough. Um, but strength obviously showed bigger numbers. Um, but also trained athletes too, which I found quite interesting with that as well. And Jared, I'm interested to see what you're going to, how you're going to take it away. Um, but for those of you that are like, what in the world is periodized training? Like I had to look that up and like, see what it talked about. And when it talked about the different psychos cycles, like the mesocycles, the macros, I was like, oh, okay, this is what this is. And having, um, like where you vary, if you're doing a strength cycle, then you're going to vary the load and the weight. Right. And then if you're endurance, you're going to vary your speed and your distance, which is, you know, the volume and stuff, um, which makes sense to me why it would, um, increase like strength gains more than I guess, hypertrophy, um, you know, muscle growth. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't have too much to add to what you guys have already talked about jared what did you uh what did you think about in the study yeah so i'll just um n not much other than than kind of what i've said it's no surprise that uh a planned program produces more strength gains than a non-planned program that's basically what they said and then hypertrophy doesn't matter and hypertrophy doesn't matter as much because of what joe joe said and that has a lot more to do with your the the sessions stimulus so like how you train that day that way. Cause if you, if you just decided, let's say hypertrophy or a muscle growth standpoint, that Monday was leg day, let's just say Monday was leg day. Uh, and you wanted your legs to grow, get bigger. Uh, you could do almost anything that you wanted to your legs on Monday. Like there's, you don't even have to stick with the same exercise. You could do leg extensions. You could do back squats. I mean, you could do whatever you wanted every Monday, change it. So long as you're hitting like the sets and rep scheme, at proper percentages, you're feeling that burn that kind of, we talked about last week, like that, that somewhat painful. If you're doing that every Monday to some portion of your leg, your legs will grow. Right. And so you, it doesn't really matter as much on the hypertrophy side, but that's not necessarily the same for strength. Um, so let's get into this non-periodized training is, I mean, it's what probably a lot of gym goers, uh, do like I, um, I worked at gyms for a very long time and, there are certain types of people who, I mean, they have consistency on lock. They are there at the same time right. every day for years on end. They're also doing the same routine. They have, like, yeah. they, they, they call it their routine. They don't call it right. training or workout. They like, they have a routine that they go through and it's this block of machines, this block of machines, 30 minutes on the treadmill, this block of machines, this block of machines, 30 minutes on the treadmill, like every day. That is really non-periodized training. Mm -hmm. um, you don't really have a plan. You might be repeating the same thing over and over again. And it's not as good for strength gains, but it's it's great for a consistency standpoint. And I'm not going to, you know, say that it's bad at all. It just depends on like kind of what your goals are. If you if you have the consistency piece down and you just want to want to go do something every day, it can be good. But at the same time, um, non-periodized uh, could also be like CrossFit if we're looking at strength training specifically. And this is where I used to get in a lot of arguments. It doesn't happen at all today because everyone realized that they were idiots in the past and, and have become smarter. Um, I, my argument back in the day with CrossFit was like, you can't get stronger. Like this is how CrossFit programming used to work. They'd be like, today we're doing six sets of one rep max of deadlift. That would be, that would be the, that would be Wednesday. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't see a deadlift like that, a heavy deadlift again for seven and a half months. 
because there'd be so much other random crap thrown in between. But the argument was that you could get plenty strong doing that. And my argument was, no, you can't. Uh, and because there's never been any strength athlete ever who's lifted any significant amount of weight, who's like, you know what, I'll just do a little bit today and then maybe some next month. No, they're, they're trying to work on that strength on a weekly basis. And so not all of CrossFit programming, but CrossFit in strength typically is taking a non-periodized approach. And if they are starting to take a periodized approach, well, that's not so constantly varied anymore, is it? Which is in the definition of CrossFit. So is it even CrossFit anymore if you're starting to periodize your strength programming? It's not CrossFit anymore. Th th these are the arguments. I love them. Uh, they just uh, go in, in circles. So anyway, non-periodized, think of strength training in true CrossFit programming fashion. Um, and that's about all I have for non-periodized training. Um, now, periodized is definitely going to work out better. And there's linear, and then there's undulating, also called non-linear if you want to um, just use the linear term. So periodized, better for strength games, same for hypertrophy. Um, and you just think of it as blocks of training. It can be, it can literally be anything. It's different when you're talking about um, an athlete um, who's training for the Olympics because they have an actual four-year training schedule, or it could be an NFL athlete who has, you know, an off season and in season um, you know, all these kind of things. So periodized training is very different depending on the athlete, um, what they have coming up, power lifters with meets coming up, but then within periodized training, there are multiple different types. What we do at garage gym athlete is probably closer to what's called block periodization, where we do these waves of four weeks. I mean, of three weeks, uh, kind of higher increasing intensity than a deload week, but then that builds off of a 12 weeks, uh, cycle. So block periodization, if you guys are looking for like terminology, still, we don't fit into that hundred percent, but that's like closest to what we'd be doing. And then they didn't look at that inside this uh, study, but then there's linear and undulating. So linear is there's a variation in blocks, and this can be either four or 12 week waves that there's just going to be variations in the, um, intensity, meaning like percentage lift and like the sets of reps volume, like Joe was talking about, like it could just be, uh, you know, two sets of five reps this week. And then it could be two sets of three reps next week, more weight on the bar though, for those repetitions. And that'd be linear. Then undulating, undulating is the hardest thing for people to program because there is no, um, science, like there are not science. There's no, um, there's no method to the madness because you can literally do whatever the hell you want and it's undulating. So undulating is when you are, you're varying what's happening either per day or per week. Um, right. but, but again, going back to that, like overall goal, if you're like, if just to think that of this in simple terms, this isn't necessarily what undulating is again, undul undulating does not have a set definition of it. It is this thing, but it, cause it could be a lot of different things. And that's where a from a programming standpoint, you have a lot of uh, leeway to do a lot of different things. But if you were like, I want to get stronger, I want to get a stronger deadlift. That's the goal. Okay. Wednesday is going to be our deadlift day. With undulating, I might do 10 sets of one on the deadlift with a bunch of accessory stuff this Wednesday, then next Wednesday, or in, in the day could even change. But like say next Wednesday, I'm still going to be working on deadlift, but now I'm going to hit the stimulus from a Con completely different set. Maybe I'm doing five by five, maybe I'm doing five by three. Uh, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm really switching it up and I'm doing one times 10, the opposite of what I did the previous week. Uh, so you're just really changing the stimulus. Typically with undulating though, you're going to, if you're programming it in a smart way, you're going to be in the same realm. So we look at Prilipin's chart a lot um, in our strength programming. And, and we've done a video on, on YouTube. If you guys want to check out Prilipin's chart and all Prilipin's chart is a uh, Russian coach back in the day, took a bunch of data and, and kind of spit out to where it's like, if you want hypertrophy, you should be in this percentage in this rep range. And so that's, and if you want strength, do this muscle endurance, do this uh, maximal strength do this. And so it gives you a lot of great guidelines on sets, reps and volume for achieving a goal. Now take that to undulating programming and undulating programming gets a lot easier because if, if you were to actually program this out and you're like, Wednesday's my deadlift day, it's like, okay, 
what are you trying to do on the deadlift day? And you say, I want maximal strength. My one rep max, I want it to increase. You don't have anything else, no strength endurance, power endurance, or anything like that. You'd say, okay, Wednesday is my deadlift day. And I want a increase for one rep max. So maximal strength. So what we would do in our programming, what we would look at is say, okay, if that's the goal of this on Wednesdays, we're going to stay within Prilipin's chart for maximal strength on Wednesdays. So you would say, and cause you can, if you're in that tier on Prilipin's chart, there are probably 30 different ways you could program that tier. So staying in the volume, staying in the sets and staying in the intensity. And if you just did that every Wednesday for 12 weeks, even though you never repeated a percentage, a set or rep scheme ever, your deadlift would still right. increase. Mm-hmm. And, and that blows people's minds. Sometimes they think it's random, but it's really not random. <laughs> once you start to like piece together how the programming works. And I'm just letting you guys know how it works for us. Cause I've done a lot on hard to kill track and I'm, right. I'm doing something like that um, over the course of 12 weeks. And if it never, like it never repeats. And, and that's hard for people to wrap, wrap their brains around because everybody, I always joke about it. I used to say it was, was William could understand this, but that kid's about to be 10 years old. He's actually like pretty freaking smart at this point. Um, so my four-year-old understands linear periodization. If I was like, Eleanor, I lifted this much weight this week. If I want to get stronger, should I lift more or less next week? She'd be like, more. Be like, You're right. You understand linear periodization. And that's about the base level that most people who aren't uh, programming on a regular basis understand when it comes to uh, just training in general and why people are generally really bad at programming for themselves because, and this is kind of my last point, linear versus undulating. They mentioned undulating works better for trained athletes. And this is the life cycle of anybody who programs for themselves and why, if you're not already following garage and athlete programming, you should, if you're like, you know what, I'm just going to do this myself. I'm going to get stronger. I'm going to do, you know what Jared says they do four week waves. I'm going to program four week wave. Okay. So what you're going to do is when you're programming for yourself is you're going to do a four week wave of linear periodization. Let's say you even have a deload in there and then you're going to do it again. And then you're going to do it again. And that works to be honest, the most, I think that it can work in my honest opinion is two years. And that's, if you're starting from zero, like not strong, not strong athlete, you could probably do linear periodization for two years and continue to see strength gains, have some fun in that process, uh, with minimal injury. But then after that two year phase, let's say, and if you're not starting from zero, you're starting in the middle there, then maybe you have a one year or less timeline that you can do that. And what happens after the honeymoon phase is over? You're going to start getting injured. You're going to start hitting plateaus and you're not going to understand it. And so what happens, and, and I love this, this cycle that athletes go through, they, they try and get a lot stronger. They through just straight linear periodization. Like I'm just going to do the same strength program over and over and over and over again. And they do it, they hurt themselves. And then they just can't train. They don't train. They're like, you know what? I, I'm going to have to take some time off. They take a lot of time off and then their strength goes down to half of what they had gained before. And then they're just going to start linear periodization over that after they feel like they're not injured anymore. And then they'll injure themselves and, like, ah. and then they go back down. And it's not like this, they're going to, they just eventually tap out altogether. They get, they get stuck, stuck at this maximal lift. And then it's just hurt, repeat, hurt, repeat, like just go through this cycle. And so linear periodization is great. I don't want to crap on it too much. It's phenomenal for strength training, but after a certain point, you're just going to start hurting yourself or you're going to feel like you're, you're getting plateaued and that's when it's time to move to undulating. So I don't have an actual uh, five, three, one continuum. Yeah. I mean, any strength program, you could put in like a 50 different names right there, but definitely Windler would be one of those. Uh, you, you have to eventually move to undulating. Um, and then if you are in our programming, probably just go on the hard to kill track. And because like the strength track to me, is just like counting macros. Like, I don't know if we have any athletes who are like, we have plenty who've said they're hard to kill for life, but strength track for life. I don't know. And I don't know if they should be because like, there's a lot of linear periodization on there. And like Joe might experience uh, like experiment with some undulating, but you I also probably, <laughs> probably also don't want to do undulating forever. Right. So no. like if you want to, um, it, that's why hard to kill track. If you're more advanced and you're starting to care less about what that actual number on the, on the bar is the hard to kill track is probably going to be the place for you in garage mouthy programming, because I'm looking at those things. We will throw in some undulating. We'll throw in some linear. We'll cycle through these. Uh, and a lot of that is, is based off of how I want to train too, because I, 
I, I don't care about much anymore other than maintenance. Just, just want to maintain a certain level of what I have. And, and that's about it. Uh, I, and I mean, I'm not even like internally driven anymore by like a weight on the bar or a speed around the track or anything. I just really want to like, eh, this is good. Like, how can I not get hurt and, and just stay at this level of fitness? That's like my goal right now. Um, and I think the hard, hard to go track is a good place to do that. So I think that's, that's everything undulating linear talked about block, non periodization, periodization. So like I said, I wanted this to be more educational than anything else. You guys got anything else on the study? Great lesson. Yeah. Great lesson. That was really good. Yeah, I, I think take your notes, Joe. I do. I, I do think I, I'm going to have a, a fun cycle of, of undulating for on strength. Um, probably in the fall. I think I'm going to call it now. Mm. Yeah, it's good. And it, it pushes a, it pushes a programmer too, because, um, programming, I like it though. yeah, it gets less formulaic and also it, it, it cures some of that, um, that ADD that people have, like, like Joe was saying, like, if you're on a strength cycle and you're like, I just don't want to do back squats today. That's just a little bit different than what I did last Monday, you know, uh, undulating programming can kind of fix that because another great thing about undulating is I was saying Wednesday to Wednesday, most of the time it doesn't even work like that. Right. It's like, we're doing deadlift on Wednesday. And then the next time we deadlift is on, on uh, you know, Monday or Friday or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, that also like breaks people's brains on the hard to kill track sometimes too. I'll get that feedback. Like what? I'm what? pretty sure I was the one who did that. Yeah. On you, oh yeah. You've like, definitely done it. You're like, it is Monday squat, squat day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And why, why did squats get moved to Wednesday? Uh, yeah. Uh, but that's the method to the madness, especially for all of our current athletes who, who wonder if I'm just like, pretending to have a method to the madness but in all reality really just know. like just like <laughs> ah whatever it's just exercise who cares um uh, okay well, let's talk about hydration um what do you guys what do you guys do to stay more hydrated in the summer it's actually more important than most people realize and i'm not just talking about drinking water i'm you know going down to like electrolytes and everything else i mean you know beer's got water and salt in it right oh lord so, like, here we go <laughs> What beer has salt? I don't Do know. They all have salt. Well, actually, a lot of them. If you you know, some people put salt in their beer. Actually, anyway. Um, Do you? No. But <laughs> I've seen I've seen, I've seen it done before. <laughs> that sounds good to me, to be honest. Salty. Beer. Uh, <laughs> so, a lot more I, like urine that way. No. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Okay, can we move on? Just how I like my beer. <laughs> nice room temperature. Uh, and so in the summer, um, I mean, thinking of last year in Bahrain, the ridiculous amount of heat that we went through, like during the day, hydration happened constantly. I was working out very first thing in the morning. So there wasn't a lot of, so, so the stress and hydration really comes the day before. You, you shouldn't like, an hour before a workout, think chug a bunch of water and then you're going to be good for it. Um, working out first thing in the morning, I would have a little bit of coffee and some water, and then I would go and work out and I wouldn't take a water. It wouldn't even take a water bottle with me. And we always worked out outside. They had a water cooler every like 15, 20 minutes. I might go after like, if I did a, a, um, a heavy set or circuit or something, I might go and have like the little Dixie cup, like two cups and then go because I didn't, I, the hydration should happen way before the workout and not during the workout. And I only went during the workout just to have a little bit during, but it, I didn't need, uh, depending on how intense I was going, um, to hydrate the entire time. I, I wasn't toting around a freaking gallon jug of water and lifting it up just to show everybody that I was drinking a gallon jug of water with a motivational quote written on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what? And I, I, we're That's talking about gym, gym bros. We've seen it's, uh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. I and I hate that. the, I, I just, I love the excuse. Like, well, I, I, I drink a gallon. I have a gallon jug because so I know how much I'm going to drink all day. Well, that's 64 ounces. You could just drink two thirty two ounces. The math is pretty simple. Anyway, that's just a, a, an entire other thing. No, Hey, were, if you like to carry on a gallon jug, you're getting your water in. That's I'm fine with it. It's just yeah. funny to me. Cause yeah. it's so large. That's why it's funny. <laughs> it's cause it's a large. Well, now they have the water bottles that are like this big and it's like at, seven you should drink this this and this and this and like people carry these things around and like how do you even put this like in your cup holder in your car you don't you have to like throw it on the floor I'm like got a backpack don't. for my water bottle <laughs> those in the past yeah I, I they really do have like the the, the satchel straps 
Um, and on, on some days when I really needed to have a little bit of extra um, hydration, I might have the um, liquid IV before. Uh, it has because it has a little bit of uh, I think a little a little bit of sugar, a little bit of carb or something in it. But little, on those lot, days, honestly, a lot of sugar. <laughs> I, I, I haven't like... <laughs> I haven't looked. But honestly, th those were the days if I'm working out first thing in the morning, I needed something that uh, so that I wasn't fasted. So I I wasn't going to load up on some sort of I don't know what I would take besides nowadays. I'm just having like an RX bar, uh, if I really need to before a workout. So, uh, that, that, that was, that was a big lesson. So working out when it was ridiculously hot, you know, 120 plus degrees in Bahrain, it wasn't even hydration. That was my problem. It was working out fasted fuel wise, because I would hit a wall at like 30, 40 minutes, start to not feel too hot. By the time I walked across the street to the little shop bet to get something in me, I was, pale and like really close to fainting and three times i had to lay on the floor in the little shopette while i recovered sipping on a fit aid just to get just just, just to be, nice. be brought back to life you yeah and it, it was sauna yeah and That's it wasn't it, it was just because i worked out fasted in 100 plus degree heat so that was just on me but yeah hydration happens all time throughout the day nice uh I guess I'll go next. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I start first thing in the morning. Um, I don't even have any uh, coffee or anything. I have to have water first. Um, I typically take my thyroid medication in the morning anyway. So it just kind of starts me out. And I normally just do, um, I try to do like 20 to 24 ounces and then I'll start with coffee. Um, but we definitely add electrolytes in, in the summertime. And it's not just for Scott and I, we also add for Connor too. I mean, the kid, poor thing, he sweats just as much as mommy and daddy does. So, um, we give him like a little half slice of noon. Cause that's how it's pronounced Joe. It's um, none. I uh, unsubscribe from the noon thing. Use don't make an O sound. Okay. Here we go. Anyways. Um, it's, it's noon. <laughs> <laughs> Um, none your business, none your yeah. business. <laughs> Don't crack me up. Um, but in Florida, I mean, it's just nasty and humid. I mean, you step outside and you just start sweating, right? So you're already losing that. So prior to a workout, it was interesting that you said you brought water with you. Like, I don't really drink water during the hour training session that I do. So I pre, and again, this was all Emily Boone's idea, but I fill up a, a cup of water put the tablet in and stick it in my fridge. And then I go and work out. Cause I know right afterwards, I'm probably going to be super thirsty and that's what I want. So, um, I typically do mine after and not before, even though maybe Jared will talk a little bit more about this, but now I'm very intrigued to see, um, about performance benefits prior to another thing that I like to do as well in the summertime, I typically only use water or almond milk or, oat milk in my smoothies, but in the summertime, I switch to uh, coconut water uh, for the electrolytes as well. And so that also helps. And I try not to do multiple noon tablets. I don't know. It's just always like, it's like the same thing with protein in my mind. I'm like, I try to only do like a scoop of protein a day instead of two protein shakes or whatnot. The same thing with noon. But if I'm Agreed. sweating excessively, I don't mind um, upping that. I've also heard good things about element T. Yeah. So I love that. It's just expensive. I would do that over liquid IV in a heartbeat. It's just like three times the price. Well, I think the reason it is, is because it's also has more salt than either noon or. It's got a thousand milligrams. Yeah. Right. One gram. Of, yeah. Sodium. So it's more which is supposed to be helping you. Right. So I feel like that's maybe why their prices are that way. Um, you can always look on Amazon and sometimes they've got those subscribe. You're just going to put straight salt put in your salt, water. Just add, <laughs> just add some salt to your life. No, that's what, uh, my buddy was like, he was a big fan of element and, uh, he was like, yeah, I get the unflavored ones. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, why don't you just is that eat salt? salt? <laughs> yeah. And he's like, uh, well, it's got like potassium. And so I was like, okay, bananas are really cheap. Like have, <laughs> have a banana and put some salt on your water. Stop paying for unflavored element. That's true. Okay. Anyways. So I am willing to look into them because I've, you know, but cause I would not be doing some unflavored. I'd be doing like lemon lime or something like that. Well, know. you're moving to Texas. So just, just drive an hour, hour and a half up and ask Rob Wolf himself for some. <laughs> 
Actually, yeah, you'd be pretty close to him. That's very true. Um, all right, so I don't worry about how many noons I have in a day, which I think is oh. it's funny because I feel like protein is probably like 10 times worse than an electrolyte supplement as far as like how it's made. Um, but I get what you're saying. Uh, you could just have salt. It's probably better. Like Himalayan pink. Well, you both said it. You both were like, he was like, I agree. I'm like, why? This is just salt. Like, um, but if you have like Himalayan pink salt or something, that would probably be better. Um, with that, would you guys be more comfortable with like something like that? I mean, over... I cook with it, but I don't necessarily put it in my. It's not that I'm uncomfortable. Water. It's just that I would rather if I, if, if I just keep down in electrolyte drinks that I'm just only going to drink electrolyte drinks and not yeah. drink actual water. So I think it just forces me to be like, okay, I had my one thing of that. I need to drink this actual water, not just down electrolytes all day. Well, and let's yeah. be real, Jared, like you're probably doing what one after training and then one after the sauna, or are you doing more than that? Oh, well, right now I'm, I'm taking a lot of sodium. Uh, so <laughs> Texas, and I, bring out the textbook. And I, and I, and I saw I, it. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So I, I'm experimenting right now. This is actually kind of new for me. Yes, you're right. Previously, I would have, well, I'd say I'd probably have the equivalent of one noon almost every day. And mm -hmm. I say equivalent because I would just, my morning drink, I do the same as you. Like I would have, uh, I have, you know, whatever, 20 to 30 ounces of water, like as soon as I wake up. Uh, but a lot of times I would put um, like Himalayan pink salt or something in that uh, oh, water. I thought you did your athletic greens. Um, I do that as well, but like, sometimes it's not always in the morning. Like I might mix it up at different times. So I just, whatever I'm having in the morning, I want to make sure it has electrolytes in it. Cause your body won't, um, won't hold on it's to the undulating. liquid as well. If you don't have, um, my, my life is undulating <laughs> <laughs> like, so much undulating. Sometimes I take my like, greens in the morning, sometimes in the afternoon. That's what like, <laughs> and, and I've talked about this publicly many times. Like I used to think I wasn't, um, a disciplined person because I was not a routine person. I am not a routine person, but I'm sure. disciplined as hell. Like uh -huh. I, if you like take athletic greens every day, sure. What time of day? Totally different. Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> and, and it used to be the same with training until my brother started training, training with me, like sometimes 5.00 AM, sometimes 8.00 PM, sometimes middle of the day, Noon. like it, it would change like all the time. Um, so anyway, yeah, I live an undulating lifestyle, but this <laughs> I'll, I'll, uh, mention the, the author by name and or I'll, I'm going to try to <laughs> Dr. James D <laughs> Dr. James D Nicolantonio. Nicole Antonio. There we go. She got it. So, um, <laughs> four names. I was recommended this book, his first book, or not, not his first book, his most recent book, and how I discovered him. Um, and I can't vouch for this guy or his information yet if anybody's like looking for my opinion. So, I don't know. Um, I'm just now like been reading some of his information because I found it interesting. I, you, you're like on the spectrums of, of like health and fitness authors right now, you don't know if they're like really smart or quack. So I'm still in that phase, but he, he seems really smart. Um, so the book win, and then he also has the book, the salt fix, and he's got a bunch of other books. Um, so I'm just interested in, in the topic of sodium, uh, and like how much you can have. And he's kind of getting into the whole, like low sodium diets are bad. And like, you know, none of the research on them are, are legit and like kind of, kind of what he's diving into. Um, and, but we can get away from like that bigger, like conspiracy theory thing. And he br brings up in this book, when, uh, these high salt solutions that for increasing athletic performance. And the reason it's interesting is because he just has, he talks about study after study, not just like his opinion. And, you know, that's always, what's going to turn my head of like these people, like cycling studies, they increase blood volume by 3.1 to 4.8% prior to exercise with a high salt solution. Uh, greater maintenance of blood volume during exercise, increase exercise duration by six minutes. And another study, they increase exercise duration at higher intensity for 20 minutes. Um, just all these like cool studies about these high salt solutions prior to performance. Um, and here's the, like the official recommendation, um, consume 2300 to 3000 milligrams of sodium and 22 to 26 ounces of fluid water over 30 minutes, starting 90 to 105, 105 minutes prior to exercise. Uh, so one more time, consume two, 2300 to 3000 milligrams of sodium and 22 to 26 ounces of water. So that would be like two of those element packs in a, like this size 
water bottle. Like that's mm-hmm. like a, a Yeti thing. Um, and then I would need to sip on that for 30 minutes. Don't chug it, sip on it for 30 minutes, about an hour and a half before I train. So, but he talks about that solution and I've heard, I've heard of a lot of people doing it. Like, and, and you get all these, um, performance benefits. So, um, less thirst, less dehydration, less hyponatremia, less fatigue, perceived exertion, less cramps, increased blood volume, increased power, increased speed, increased endurance, decreased core body temperature, decreased heart rate. Uh, so those are the things that I want to try it for. Um, he's, he does say specifically, if like you're going into like a zone two or like lower intensity thing, um, it's not going to be as helpful unless you are maybe in a high heat environment, uh, which could be like Florida <laughs> Texas. or Texas, but even it, even, with that, you should probably be on the lower side of the sodium scale because you're, it's not as necessary. But if you're going into a, an event where you need to perform, um, this is definitely worth trying. I'm going to try it uh, before, I don't know, maybe like Murph on Memorial Day or like something like that. Um, I'm going to try it. And I'll try it before then too. I never, I always say like, don't, don't change things up on game day, right? Like don't try right. something new on game day. Uh, so I'm going to try it in some other uh, sessions as well. It's not going to be something, and I don't think that you should do that every day, but it's cool to know like how, <clears throat> how you should approach this and how you can uh, really increase performance. And maybe we can co- cover some of these studies in future podcasts, but I mean, he has a, a handful of them here talking about these high salt solutions before exercise, kind of following those guidelines. Um, and I think that it's, really cool and really interesting. So I definitely want to try it. Um, and for me, I've just been, the reason I've been having more and more, uh, salt and electrolytes is, uh, I started looking at my diet. Um, and this is also kind of like an update. I was under eating on calories. And then I also, once I started like typing everything in to like a, uh, like a macro tracker, you know, it is tracking your sodium too. And I was having, I was not having a lot of sodium at all. I like, I just figured I was having a good amount. I was like, yeah, yeah. I put salt on my eggs and like, whatever, like, but I wasn't having a lot of sodium. And so I was like, well, I'm going to try increasing my sodium. And when you have a pretty regimented diet, um, I, it's harder to get sodium than you thought, uh, than I thought, uh, other than putting more salt on it, but putting too much salt on something can make it taste bad. I mean, I'm yeah. no expert, but <laughs> Joe, you let me know if that's true. Um, I feel like too much salt on food can, it can also, it can make it taste a lot better or ruin it. Um, so that bell curve. yeah, <laughs> you gotta have the right amount. Um, and so anyway, I've been trying a lot more, um, and noon only has about 300 milligrams of sodium. So yeah, it's, it's not, not even much. that much. Uh, so element, uh, is good if you want a high, um, high sodium content, but the, my biggest beef with element is it has no sugar and Rob Wolf will argue with you about this all day, but the science doesn't necessarily agree with him. He's got some other science where he's kind of skirted around it, but <clears throat> your body needs sugar to transport electrolytes. Like that's its transport mechanism. So element has no sugar. So if you, huh. if you're eating, I would say, close to also close to the time when you're also having an element, your body doesn't like necessarily treat those separately. Like it's like, if you ate a banana and then you drink an element, that's enough sugar for that. Like your body will, will put those things together. It's not like it has to be like bonded molecularly before you ingest (laughs) it. Like your body will figure it out. But if you are having like an element fasted in the morning, I don't know if that's as beneficial if your body uses it as much. Um, And like I said, Rob Wolf says, that it does. And he's got some science that points to it, but a lot more science points towards, uh, electrolytes need sugar. And so that's why noon has one gram of sugar, uh, liquid IV. What you're talking about, Joe has like 13 grams of sugar. I, I took that stuff a few times and it's amazing. Like it tastes really good. Of course it does. Right. Cause there's a lot of sugar. And then I dropped that habit because of, I was like, I can't, I can't, it's this can't time. be my, like my pre-workout <laughs> drink. Like, cause I'll end up, I'll, that would, that would be one of those things that's not undulating and be like, well, I need my liquid IV before I start my workout. And I could be doing like a zone two workout where like sugar is not even necessary. You know, I'm just like, so anyway, I dropped that habit, but those, I think those are good for, um, again, specific use cases, uh, longer duration, like, uh, in the middle of a session, I think a liquid IV would be really good. If it's like a, like an hour and a half to two hour session, liquid IV probably be awesome. Um, but yeah, that's a it. Fit Aid or a Kill Cliff has for electrolytes. Cause I know they, nothing. I think they do though. I, I think they down. advertise that, but 
I always thought those drinks were like the most expensive waste of money other than the taste. Oh. Okay. I like I how mean, they they're taste. Just fantastic. Yeah. I just, I, I just ordered a case. You guys know I, I've had, I've had fit aids for a long, like I don't, I'm actually haven't been buying them for a long time now, but I used to always have a fit aid like post-workout, but never once would I have told you I'm taking this fit aid for its recovery benefits. No. I'd be like, I'm taking, I'm drinking this fit aid because it's really good. Taste Pure good. Fabulous. After, like after oh, yeah. my workout. That's it. That's the only reason. Uh, but like if you're fall, if you're like, oh, I think my recovery is better after drinking this. It's like, oh yeah. Those like sprinkled in proprietary ingredients. Like you think, <laughs> you think those like d- trace amounts are helping you. Um, so anyway, it, those are good drinks, but yeah, stay on top of your electrolytes because I also, I sweat a lot during a training session and then I do a sauna almost every day. Uh, I don't know how many, like I might actually sweat like a gallon a day. Like, I don't know what it is, but it's a lot of You're sweat. You're not that sweaty of a person. So there's that. No, but when it gets hot in the garage, my body will do what it needs to. And then the sauna is, it might take like a couple minutes, but after it gets going, like I sweat a lot. So, uh, trying to stay on top of those things. And I think that's the most important thing listeners should probably pay attention to is just as it heats up, stay on top of your electrolytes and, Emily also bought some like trace minerals to like stay on top of those without having to ingest sodium every time. And I I like those as well, because if you're like, I kind of want a noon, but you know what? I think I'm good on salt today. These trace minerals have like almost no sodium in in it. And it's just all the other electrolytes that your body needs. So something else that you can also look into. I have a small story with the trace minerals. So Emily made me, not made me, but Emily highly encouraged me to buy these. Right. And before it was like, I got it, got the bottle and I was so excited. And I was like, I'm going to put it in my water. So I turn it and it says one serving is half a teaspoon. So I'm like, okay. 40 drops. Yep. So I'm like, okay, here we go. Half a teaspoon oh, in gosh. this <laughs> cup of water. It, I literally gagged. Like it was yeah. awful. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, no. Spread it out throughout the whole day. I'm like, why doesn't the bottle say that? So if you're going to get the trace minerals, make sure you're putting like eight to 10 drops. Did in. she happen to tell you that I did the same exact thing? <laughs> no, she did not. Yeah. yeah she, uh, <laughs> she didn't tell me that either. And I did the 40 drops all in like, it was like, probably worse. It was like an eight ounce glass of water. And I'm just going to down this really quick. And I downed it. And I was like, that was the worst drink ever. Um, Dude, it it tastes horrible. Mm-mm, but no way. She, she has all sorts of weird stuff. There's this other supplement. Um, I can't remember what it was now. It was something fairly harmless. It like vitamin D. I don't, I don't remember what it was. But then I was like, it was in like a dropper bottle. And, and I was like, no, it, it may be. Yeah, maybe it was iodine. And I felt like I needed it for some reason. I was like, yeah, I'm going to have this. And I took the dropper and I just squeezed it on my tongue. No. <laughs> and it, I got like a chemical burn, like on my, like my lips and my tongue. And I, I was like trying to spit it out, but it's like the damage is already done. Like, I don't know what's going on. I'm like trying to rinse out my mouth. I'm like, how do you take that? She's like, you have to mix it in like a lot of liquid um, and take a lot less. <laughs> and I was like, well, that that ruined me for a few days. So, Oh man. <laughs> and just one last thing. Um, I don't have any eyedropper stories cause I don't have <laughs> stuff, stuff like you guys. Maybe I'll try and get these trace minerals. I don't have no idea. You should. Uh, I probably would have, I probably would have done the same thing. I uh, just put it in one little cup, <laughs> but we're doing quarterly trying to do quarterly book things at our, um, uh, book club in, in the group. So last quarter was the perfect mile and this quarter will be the salt fix. So we're going to do the, that book, but also the, so we're reviewing that book in June. So a couple of months or, Oh, that's next month. It's May now. Yeah. So end of June, beginning of July, we'll, we'll have a review for the salt fix coming out just while we're uh, talking about it now. So if you want to read it, that's when we're going to be talking about it. Awesome. Well, let's get uh, this, this uh, workout and get out of here. <clears throat> All right. BO3 fit test. So this is a pretty good assessment of a lot of different things to see where you're at. Uh, this is kind of a, a, a lot of people do this when they first join. Um, and it's a good be- uh, benchmark to go to, to do uh, periodically. And it's also a decent meter on Saturday because a couple of these things really suck. Uh, so the first thing is the 10, not 11. This one, uh, I think it started or came up around the same time as the one when one kettlebell program, but you would do a set of uh, kettlebell strict press 
where you're looking to do a set of 10, a, find a weight that you can do 10 reps of and not 11 reps of. So weird. That, that name's on, so weird. Like 10, yeah. not 11. Like, what does it mean? Yeah. Uh, and that is on both arms. So if you get, um, you know, 10 reps of a 57 something that on your right and only 10 reps of a 52 on your left, then your weight is 52, whatever your lower weight is, uh, whatever your weaker arm is, is the, is the score for that one. Then you have the 10 second battle test, which is, uh, 10 seconds of, uh, thrusters. thrusters. A single arm kettlebell thrusters on one arm and then single arm kettlebell thrusters on the other arm 10 seconds as many reps as possible that one you can only get so many because it's only 10 seconds and then you're going to rest three minutes then it's testing how powerful you are yeah yeah <laughs> so you can real. <laughs> you're confused minutes, about why calling. i programmed it that way <laughs> no yeah maybe um <laughs> then you have six minutes for max meters. You're going to run six minutes for max meter. So all out run for six minutes. This one sucks. It is hard, but you have plenty of rest between or before and plenty of rest after. So six minutes, max meters, pretty simple there. Then you are going to, after you rest, math says, I don't know, nine minutes, something like that. Um, you're going to do a three minute kettlebell snatch test. So three minutes, as many kettlebell snatches as you can do. Is that alternating or not? I don't see it on here. I believe it is alternating. That's what I think too. too. Uh, it's three minutes, max kettlebell snatch. It, uh, yeah, that one is not fun at all. And then there you go. That is Joe the workout. doesn't like this one, apparently. <laughs> it's just been a while since I've done it. it. It has been a while. I love the EO3 fitness test. So big picture, it's walking mm -hmm. you through all the energy systems and also in the format that they should be appropriately trained. So the reason the snatch test is less is because it lasts is because it's glycolytic. And if you're going to put multiple different energy systems in the same training session, glycolytic should always be last. Uh, you have oxidative right there in the middle, uh, anaerobic stuff there at the beginning, and then a strength element. Uh, so it's, it's a really solid test. Um, and it will expose a lot of holes in anybody's game. Because if you're like the 10, not 11 strength test, you're like, I, I only get three reps. Like how on earth does anybody get more reps than that? Well, a <laughs> lot of people max it out and they max it out because they're powerful athletes and they could do that. And it's not a problem. And if, so if you, if you're down there, you realize you're not very powerful, same with the strength test, same with the max meters, same with, um, the, the snatch test. If you can't handle the snatch test, you don't, you don't have a big like glycolytic engine there or some, it, not necessarily you have to work on that, but it's something that you, you could work on. Um, so I love the EO3 fitness test, especially when you combine it with, um, like the three main lifts that we typically test and train being, you know, back squat, uh, strict press and deadlift. And that, that's kind of how we give like this bigger score to your overall fitness level. But the EO3 fitness test by itself is, is awesome. I might even do it today. Who knows? I, I like it. Chill. Do we used to do this before or like almost every foot week or whatever when we like back in the day? I no, think I, so. I think we did. We should. It we tested it more often. than a few times. Yeah, I got moved to being a meet yourself Saturday, which to be honest, it's not really a, like it wasn't meant for that. And it's really not a meet yourself Saturday until you get to that snatch test. And then it, the whole thing is a meet yourself Saturday because yeah. I run the six meters or the six minutes of max meters. And I'm like, I'm like already nervous about the snatch test. Yeah. <laughs> I got to try hard here, but like, damn it, that snatch test is going to suck. And, and it always yep. does. Well, and then that's what, what was one of my tips from someone who uh, did not adhere to the rest times. The rest times are your friend. And when you, even if you think that you are um, ready to roll, just wait it out. It's okay. <laughs> um, so that was going to be one of my tips, but, um, yeah. And then I said for the six minutes, like keep it at your PR mile pace, but at that last minute or last 30 seconds, just go like turn on the boosters. That's when it's, you know, time to roll. Um, I did this on a track, so it was a lot easy, a lot easier. Um, we did this a lot in England when we were there. I remember doing it with the girls. Um, but it's eye opening to see too, like, um, we've, you know, talked a little bit about imbalances on different sides and whatnot. And so I feel like it was always eye-opening to me and funny, I'm right-handed. 
but my right arm was my limiting factor and not my left arm. Hmm. Same. My left is stronger than my right. I don't know why. Yeah. Mine is not. Huh. See, it's funny. It's funny to, so you'll, you'll definitely learn a lot about yourself in this. And so definitely get after it. And, um, especially those 10 seconds, you're like, why in the hell am I even doing this? Just, just do it. <laughs> Push, go. Um, yeah. Those are my tips. Make sure you practice everything. I'd say run through everything, at least kind of not like do it fully, but run through everything. Um, get some press sets in, get some snatches in, you know, alternating back and forth, just, you know, even if it's just like 30 seconds of practice, so that you know what's coming. And so you're f- fully warmed up and primed and ready to go so that you could just, because once you start the test, it's pretty much dead set on what you're, what you're doing when uh, you don't really have time to like practice in between and get warmed up. So do like a, a, a mock run through, um, so that when you actually do it, you're, you're good to go. So kind of an extended warm up for this, because it's kind of like to the same vein of, um, the Dio de los Huertos, the death by, cause everything you're doing, like there's breaks in between, it's not going to be overly crazy by the end of the day, but everything you're doing is basically max effort. So you gotta make sure you're ready for it. Yeah. Uh, my two tips, uh, 10 on 11, that's easy. Whatever you'll, you'll find out how strong you are there. Um, the 10 second battle test, be careful on that one. Um, don't try to go so fast that you lose form. And that, that's always the case, right? We are, we're always saying that. So, um, cause you don't want to be trying to do these thrusters and then the kettlebell like tweaks your arm or something like that. So like keep really good form with that, uh, max meters, not a lot to say there, uh, beyond what Ashley has said. And then, um, for the snatch, so the snatch is testing glycolytic. That means there's, there's no, um, if you want to do well on it, there's no, there's no resting. It's, right. it's three minutes of, of effort. Uh, and that's what sucks about it. And so it's really just like, it's going because to, to max that out, uh, for me and my 10, not 11 is typically, uh, the two pood, like 72 pounds. And so it's like, I pretty much want to throw up every time I do that three minutes snatch test. <laughs> And that's just where it takes me every time. And it's, it's pretty awful. So that's where you should be. If you're like, is this supposed to be that hard? Yeah, it should be that hard. But, uh, but same with the form on that one. Don't get sloppy because you're trying to get a number, you know, keep the form good. Cause that's a lot of snatches with a kettlebell and a short amount of time. So be careful, but that's it on this one. Uh, so we'll roll out of here for all the garage gym athletes taking part of our training. We really appreciate you guys, um, for making the community what it is. Uh, and for anyone who's not a part of the training, go to garage sign up for a free 14 day free trial. We would love to have you, but that's all we have for today. Uh, remember if you don't kill comfort, comfort will kill you. Gym athlete podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garage You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, the garage gym athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Thanks for listening.